Hello and welcome. On this video I thought I'd do something a little bit different. I've done a few walking through history videos but I thought I'd do a few cycling through history videos. Uh, this one being Denby Mental Hospital. So I've just come through Rudlin. I'm at St Asif now and this town deserves its own actually it's not a town it's a city it's got city status but it's the size of a town it warrants its own video which I may do in the future uh, so we're going to head up now towards Denby so I'm not on my gravel bike today I'm on my trusty uh, road bike this is what I use every day for work I put a couple of panniers on the back uh, the frame bag that's been with it since year dot and I've got a, a handlebar bag on it as well from Lomo so that's what I'm using today. The North Wales Hospital opened in 1844 and took just four years to build. The land on which it was built was donated by philanthropist and High Sheriff of Denbyshire, Joseph Ablett. The stone came from a nearby quarry. And physician Dr Lloyd Williams was the driving force behind the building of it. Initially it housed up to 200 people with mental illness, but at its peak in the mid 20th century it had over 1,500 patients. In its early days treatment remained degrading, loosely monitored and poor until the passing of the 1945 Lunacy Act. Reasons for admission to an asylum were varied and absurd by today's standards. Ill treatment by husband, kicked in the head by a horse, laziness, novel reading, death of sons in war, superstition, grief, greediness and feebleness of intellect, to name just a few. In 1890 the Lunacy Act was revised which meant that the hospital assumed a character similar to that of a Victorian workhouse. Patient welfare and therapeutics was of little importance. Following the initial building works there are ongoing debates concerning the extent of overcrowding and how to resolve it. Substantial extensions were made between 1862 and 1865. A new wing was built to house an additional 150 patients. Over time more and more buildings were erected. During my research for this video, I was able to find an annual report for the hospital dated 1950. It made for a fascinating read. The top graph here shows the patient numbers are steadily climbing to 1,500. I was astounded when I stumbled across even older reports from 1851 when the hospital was called the North Wales Lunatic Asylum. Documents of this kind can be invaluable in telling us what conditions at the asylum were like. On page 20 in the chaplain's report, it says that the chaplain trusts that the time is not far off when the adoption of gas or some other mode of lighting up the wards so essential to the comfort and happiness of the patients will justify him making an application of this kind to the committee of management. Applying some logic to this statement, we can assume that at this time candles were the only form of lighting in the hospital. During the Victorian era, medical practices and methods were very crude. One procedure that would have been employed at the hospital was that of bloodletting. It was believed 
that by draining blood from the patient, a whole host of diseases and ailments could be cured. Barber surgeons throughout history displayed a pole outside their shops, indicating that bloodletting was one of the many services they provided, and these poles are still in existence today. Another controversial procedure that became popular in the 1930s was that of lobotomy. Originally, this involved hammering a surgical implement through the patient's eye socket into the brain in an attempt to sever the frontal lobes. Techniques developed over time from drilling into the skull to actually sawing the skull. In case you were wondering, lobotomies are no longer performed, although they are still legal as far as my research can tell. Next we move on to electroconvulsive therapy. Typically 70 to 120 volts were applied externally to the patient's head with direct current passing between the electrodes. Convulsive therapy was introduced in 1934 and during its historical use was mistakenly used to treat schizophrenia and epilepsy. In the UK in 1980 an estimated 50,000 people received ECT annually. This declined to about 12,000 a year in 2002. Male and female patients were housed in separate wings and those who were able were employed within the hospital grounds. The males worked in the gardens and helped with farm duties. The females were assigned to duties in the wash houses and with sewing. There was an on-site farm but farms were also purchased in an effort to make the hospital as self-sufficient as possible. At the farm they had their own staff yeah. and uh, there was things like uh, Swedes and things like that which uh, we grew on the farm. Other members of the farm were Jack Evans the bailiff Evan Jones, the tractor driver, Tom Davis and Edwin Roberts Carters, Joe Bumby and Evan Williams, Calvin. Also on the farm was Mr. Johnny Maddox, uh, slaughterman and butcher. The farm had a huge uh, dairy herd which provided the hospital with dairy milk. They also had two massive bulls. They also kept a, a large piggery and uh, fowls. We supplied the uh, hospital with eggs. Johnny Maddox used to slaughter and then we provided the hospital with meat. One of these farms was Pennant Farm just down the road from the main entrance. There was even a bandstand in the hospital grounds. The first orchestra probably was formed in uh, 1870 um, to our knowledge um, and continued probably as an orchestra uh, until the Second World War where it's evolved into a brass band and when I joined in the 60s we had a, a brass band.